Hi, Morgan Quaid here. Uh, I'm a writer and musician, music producer, and all-round creative genius. You can find me on www.morganquaid.com, and you are watching the Two Geeks Talking Show. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. Welcome to Rapid Fire. The concept of Rapid Fire is simple. 11 questions, 9 to 15 minutes for the interview itself. And we get to talk with creative and talented people in the entertainment industry. So who is our first guest today? Our guest today is a very talented comic creator and writer and author and prose and musician and all around talented individual. You saw his work and his interview, of course, on the show earlier. We are joined today by the ever talented Morgan Quaid. How are you doing today? Hey, very good. Thanks for having me, Kurt. Great I mean, to uh, great to be here again. I was saying earlier, it feels like it's it's been like yesterday when you first arrived. So it does. It feels like nothing has changed, and yet. We've been so busy <laughs> in the interim. Let's kind of touch on that here. We obviously have a short amount of time, but we're going to dive into the, of course, your comic here today. And, you know, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking today. Great. So I am uh, Morgan Quaid, a writer of novels, short stories, comics, uh, screenplays, anything that can be written, I will give it a go. Today, we're talking about a, a Kickstarter project that I've got going at the moment for a comic series called Emnity. That's E-N-Mitty. It can be a bit tricky. Yeah, I sometimes feel a bit guilty for choosing that as the title, but Emnity. Emnity is a story about a 16-year-old girl who is searching the post-apocalyptic world looking for her deadbeat dad. Uh, her mother dies, and then she sets out on a journey to fulfill her mother's last wish, uh, last wish, I should say, not last witch, which is to find her estranged father. The twist is that her estranged father is actually Lucifer, who has inadvertently caused the apocalypse because of his unwillingness to do his job. 16 years earlier, Lucifer was kind of fed up with doing the thing that he does and decided that's it, I'm done, I'm quitting. He goes on a very large uh, bender and then as a result of that ends up getting someone pregnant and then this girl sort of comes out as a result of that relationship. It's really about a daughter searching for her father within the, the larger backdrop of this sort of cosmological story of angels and all that sort of uh, intrigue and stuff. Nice. And humor. There's a bit of humor in there too. When you talked about this uh, during our last interview, we dived really into a lot of your creative process and your creative works here as well too. But what is it about this particular story that, that spoke to you and will speak to others that are picking up issue one and two for the first time? The thing that really spoke to me in a previous younger life, uh, <laughs> studied theology, was sort of fascinated with uh, ancient Hebrew stories and, and those sorts of things. And that sort of literature really spoke to me because I had had a, a lot of knowledge of that tradition. I love the idea. I came across this notion of Lucifer or before the idea of the devil as being the adversary. So someone that actually more or less works for God, but keeps things in balance and makes sure that uh, things are questioned and not just taken on the word of whoever's talking. And I really like that idea. So the Lucifer within this world is more of that character rather than the traditional notion. Uh, I'm also attracted to the idea of taking something that people are very, very used to and they're accustomed to seeing it and then sort of turning it on its head. And then I just love the idea of a incredibly powerful young character uh, and in this case female character who is discovering her power and discovering what it means to be the daughter of lucifer and all that that, that entails but in a way that is made more human because she's just a, she's just a kid that's becoming an adult at the same time I, I, I like that sort of story and i like the unexpected nature of sort of what what comes out of that just from some of the images i've seen and looking at of course the youtube video or sorry your kickstarter video i should say in in what you're promoting of course with issue two i, I really found that you know you have action you have interesting character designs you you definitely have a wonderful art that goes along with with your dialogue from what, what i've gotten to read you know who is the team around this particular book as well too and and has it changed from from issue one 
Yes, it has has changed from issue one. By necessity, I couldn't go with the original artists that uh, there was an artistic team for, for book one because of availability issues. So then I, I went to uh, David Schwartz is, is an American uh, comic illustrator, did an amazing job on issue two. So I've actually had two sort of creative teams, but then there are also two spin-off comics uh, and a graphic novel which are from two different artists as well. So it, it really is a creative team. It's fine to sort of have two issues and the main story continuing, but I love the idea of having spin-off issues that kind of develop the story more broadly and bring in other characters. So that's what I've done. So there's kind of four books and a graphic novel all pointing to the main story, which just allows me to do some really cool, interesting stuff. And some of them are black and white. Uh, the, the main ones are in color. And some of them have more of a manga style feel. Uh, so a lot of action, a lot of sort of raw emotion and that sort of stuff. So it's really good to, to be able to, you watch your favorite series or your favorite film, uh, and then they'll bring out a, like an origin story or a side issue or something like that, or a side story. I really like the idea of giving readers that upfront so they can really dig into the, the story. And it's, it just gives more value to people as well. I find that you're getting a lot of, of amazing story and content, especially for this campaign, but you're also exploring the world that you built as well too. And I think that's, mm. that's generous when it comes to these types of campaigns. Cause usually when you get a, a, a Kickstarter campaign for a comic, it's usually a, a one and done situation it's all about the issue itself it's and mm. what and you can get then past issues but i love that you're you're expanding the world to showcase uh, the other aspects of the apocalypse and telling more stories and i think that's just great to see yeah and look it, a lot of it comes from uh firstly my desire to explore more of the story and the world and the characters um it's also though i've backed a lot of campaigns myself i know the disappointment of you see this campaign it looks amazing you back it three or four months later you get the book you read it you love it but it's this tiny little thing that you're done with and that you feel a little bit shortchanged because you think well now i've got to wait another six 12 months for the next one and then i will have forgotten the first so i'll have to sort of go back i really like the idea of being able to give readers a, a bigger chunk of the story in one go so it feels like you're really getting good value and also that's the reason why some of the, the books are black and white because they're a third or a quarter of the cost to make than the, than the color and they also have a different aesthetic so that there's different things you can do with the black and white on a purely logistical and financial level it, it means that i can offer more to people without completely sinking the campaign and never being able to recoup anything near costs. So yeah, it sort of comes out of my own experience and, and wanting more from the things that I really like as well. Do you think researching a Kickstarter campaign, even though you're, you're a, a veteran to these types of crowdfunding campaigns, do you think researching before you start your first campaign is, is vital to the success of it? Absolutely. I back a lot of campaigns just to support other indies, but I also back very big campaigns that I wouldn't normally necessarily back because I want to see how they do it. Because as soon as you back a campaign, you see all the updates that they send through and how they run the campaign, if they do any giveaways. So for instance, at the moment, actually this week, I'm doing a giveaway for the backers of my campaign, they can win their own theme song. So your own personal theme song that I'll write and produce for you. And it's yours. And I did that with the last campaign. It was really successful. People loved it. So there's things like that, that you learn by backing other campaigns and by, you know, getting involved with them and the bigger ones sometimes are not necessarily better, but you, you can just see, you know, how professional are they with communicating with people? What little extras do they add in those sorts of things? So yeah, I definitely learn a lot from them. If you're running your first campaign, absolutely get in and back a bunch of campaigns, see how they're structured, see what tiers they offer and get in contact with the person and say, Hey, how did you do this? What, what did you find? Cause we're always trying new things. Some things just don't work. Some things work really well. The other thing though, up front. So I, I work with um, Inked Marketing and they help me with, with sort of the marketing side of things and structuring my early campaigns in particular and sort of sense checking what I do. There's the services like that, but also you want to talk to someone and you want to have very realistic expectations about your first and second and third campaigns. You're not going to do what Keanu Reeves did. You're not going to release a, a comic with your name on it and then, oh, a million backers. You know, that's not going to happen. You will really struggle initially to get people to your campaign. And it takes two or three to get enough momentum that, okay, I've got a core group. 
that know what I can offer and know that I'll deliver on what I promise because there's a lot of customer service involved as well. And then once you get that, then you slowly sort of start to build. So there's no magic bullet, unfortunately. Some things hit and some things don't. What are some things that didn't hit in the first issues campaign that you, you may never do again? Well, some of them didn't really hit, but I, I, I still do them. It's that thing where you don't, sometimes if you don't find, I get a lot of feedback, you don't know if it's uh, worked or not. So because I'm a musician and producer and everything, I do a lot of music. So for every issue that I produce, I'll produce, or every campaign, I'll produce a soundtrack for that campaign as well. So Enmity has a, a, its own soundtrack. Previous campaigns have had soundtracks because it's something quick and easy that I can do and it gives people something extra. Now, to date, I have not really heard anyone come back and said, oh, that really was the thing that drew me to your campaign or that was really great or I, it really sold it to me. I, I'm not sure that it's really made a substantial difference to anything, but I keep doing it mainly because it doesn't cost me. It's something I can do. I enjoy it. And it's an extra thing I can add without having to pay, you know, a huge amount of money for another cover artist or something like that. One thing that I, I haven't done as yet, or I've limited is quite often you can pay a very well-known artist to do a, a variant cover in the hopes that that will bring more interest to your you know, campaign. That's quite a common thing to do. I've not gone to very well-known artists, mainly because the cost is prohibitive compared to what you're trying to recoup with all the printing and, and everything else. In my mind, it just hasn't made financial sense to do that yet. Plus, there are so many great indie artists lower down the pecking order in terms of being known and all the rest of it, but the artwork is great. I'm much more willing to go with them. It's better on my you know, wallet. Mm -hmm. um, it means I can offer more to the buyer. So this current campaign has six different covers, You know, a whole bunch of different options. I wouldn't be able to do that if I'd gone with just one top tier uh, artist. <laughs> I'd have one cover and that's it. And then the other one that I'm currently doing on this campaign that I've never done before is stickers, uh, A5 prints, these sorts of things here. So there's uh, A5 prints. That one, there's my my, my favorite, nice. I like that. you know, and stickers and there's a bookmark and, you know, all those sorts of things. I've not done those before because I'm in Australia. So it's, quite, it's expensive to ship that over to America. Yeah. Whereas now I've got a tier that if people really want it, they, they'll get the whole package and you send it across. I may never do that again. <laughs> we'll see how it goes this time. But it's also the fear of missing out that, you know, if you say you'll never do this again, if there's no interest in it, then it'll be, you might get a rush and then you'd be like, ah, oh, damn, now I have to do this every time. You never know. That's one of the, one of the curious things about this whole thing is it's great because you can connect with fans, which is a hard thing to do normally, unless you're at a, at a con or something. But the downside is, most people, and I completely get it, most people aren't going to message you or leave notes or interact a lot. They're just happy to buy the thing and support it and all the rest of that. So it's really hard to just get that feedback from people. Is any of this working? Is it, you know, so I'm kind of at a point now where there's enough people giving feedback that I know kind of what's working and what maybe isn't. Uh, another one that I'm trying this time around that I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it's all for fun. I'm doing a five minute uh, feature film. It's not a feature film, but you know, a five minute film. It's a horror comedy film based in the, in the world. It's just a goofy, funny little thing. And five uh, backers will be chosen to be actors within the, the production. So all you need is a webcam, something else, which you'll have to look at the campaign to see. But again, it's a bit of fun. I'm not sure if anyone's going to be interested in this at all, but honestly, I think it's hugely fun and amusing to me. So I'm going to do it anyway. You know, I might not ever do it again. We'll see, but it's all good fun. So I'm enjoying it. It might be interesting because if it's about five minutes, then you could just break it up into five parts to release it on say a TikTok or something like that in different bits as part one, two, three, four, five. That's true. Yeah. Five, yeah. Chapters. We could, mm. it could be the start of something amazing. Well, the, 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 uh, film is called, uh, Chester of the apocalypse. It's, Intrigued. Yes, indeed. Yeah. It's a terrible title, but that that's kind of by design, you know, unless it's Chester field of the apocalypse, then it's to something completely different. Well, there you go. It can be whatever you want. <laughs> Get involved people. You know. <laughs> It's amazing to see what you've come up with and what you're doing. And like I said, a lot has changed, yet much has stayed the same, it feels like, at least. Since we last talked, though, besides this campaign, what else has 
come up in, in your creative life that you'd like to share? Well, probably the, the biggest and most exciting thing, well, there's two things. So there's an, actually today, there's a, a comic called Blade in the Dark, which is a sort of samurai style, black and white mm-hmm. horror uh, style comic, which is from Black Caravan, which is a horror imprint for Scout Comics. So that's coming out today. I'm super excited about that because that's really, the artwork is amazing, really cool story. The other thing, though, is I've I've written a script for uh, an indie film which is going to start shooting early next year called A Blood Moon Rising, and it has a Old West vibe but with supernatural werewolfy type themes. That was really cool. I'm actually still, I'm just polishing the end of the, the script now. That was amazing because you're writing a script when you know the director and there's actors and you know it's actually going to be a thing. So it's not like every other screenplay, which is you just write it and then pass it off to the wind and hope that someone in the world will pick it up and ruin the movie for you. In in this case, it's so much different because I, I know that there are, I can see the pictures of the, the actors and that's been really, really fascinating. You know, I mean, there's even, there's props involved and there's the whole shooting locations and everything. So just being part of that side of that industry for the first time is is just great, great fun. Yeah. And of course, I'm going to lean into some of the comic book side as well and produce some artwork to go with it and all that sort of stuff. Because why not, you know, and some music, there's a couple of parts in it for me as well. So I will be making kind of an appearance in the film as well. So your theatrical debut is is upon us. Indeed. Indeed. I am a actor or something equivalent. We'll see. So yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Really fun. Do you have a speaking line or anything like that? Oh, I wrote the script. I definitely have speaking lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At this stage, it looks like I'll be doing the narration for the intro and some few bits. And then there is a role. There's a nice little role that I wrote for myself in the middle, which is just audio, which is fantastic because you never see this character, which is great because I'm in Australia and I can't fly all the way over to the US just to do this little little bit. So yeah, so I'll, I'll be in there. Great fun. Really great fun. Uh, is there anything you we haven't touched on you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview? The main stuff is just go to morganquaid.com and you'll see more or less everything that I'm I'm doing, or you can find me on social media, usually at Morgan Quaid or Morgan Quaid writing. Just go to morganquaid.com. You'll see everything uh, in there. Yeah, lots of exciting stuff. Really excited about the Amnesty campaign at the moment and the film that I'll be producing as a result of it that no one will watch. And the screenplay stuff is really, really cool as well. Yeah. Other than that, yeah, I'm just just having a blast. Well, I do hate to say this, Morgan, because this is a short interview, we can't spend a few hours together and just chit chat about anything and everything about your career, which means to 2023, you're more than welcome to come on back. Love to have you back on anytime. Open open forum for you here on Digging Stalking. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Kurt. Thanks for having me on again. And thank you to your listeners and viewers. Like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash tgtmedia. And our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash tgtmedia. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening, watching on Two Geeks Talking.